uh, what a great uh, insight. So uh, somebody hurts you, and so what do you do? Um, you go directly to that person. Now, in this, uh, in the age of coronavirus and all of the uh, all of the things that are going on, oh, we got another guest who's coming. Um, in the age of coronavirus, you know, we see each other on screens and masks and everything. It's hard to sit down with somebody. And we've got, you know, we've become a culture of digital devices. So, uh, so you know, we send texts and send emails uh, probably uh, more than we actually uh, sit down and talk to each other anymore. But, you know, you want to ask, uh, we want to ask ourselves the question whether uh, technology helps to make things sometimes better or worse for us. Um, so have you ever, uh, have you ever sent a, an email or a, uh, uh, a text that was misunderstood by someone else? <laughs> this past week? <laughs> I mean, it happens all the time. So these, so these digital devices, as convenient as they are, uh, there is there's something about being able to sit down face to face with others and to be able to, uh, to look them in the eye and to have a conversation with them, especially when pain is involved or when you've hurt me in some way, because it, it allows for the kind of give and take that can happen in a place like that. And it allows you to be able to say, you know, I'm, I, you know, I'm, a, I'm a child of God. I am precious. Uh, made in the image of God. And so when I'm wounded, when I'm hurt in some way, um, that, that something important has happened. I'm an important person. And so, so we, as, we as Christians are not doormats. We're not meant to just kind of put up with stuff. Uh, when we're wounded or hurt, it's important for us to be able to address it. And so this opportunity to be able to sit down one-on-one -on -one with a person and to be able to just kind of lay it out for them. And, and they may not have even realized what it is that they've done. Or I may be wrong, I may have misunderstood. And so to be able to sit down and have this conversation is something about, about just the opportunity to build relationships. And so then if the other person says, oh, the, I, I did didn't, I didn't know that I impacted you that way, or, or I'm so sorry I was in a hurry, or whatever it is. If there's able to be then, then confession or repentance and forgiveness, then it's just, then, then now all of a sudden there's an opportunity for renewed energy and mutual understanding, uh, a gift. But it doesn't always happen like that. <laughs> Um, um, Jesus says uh, that there are times when you can sit down with another person and it still doesn't kind of work. And so what do you do then? Uh, he says, um, but if they will not listen, <clears throat> take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So he's saying, so, uh, so if this is still not resolved, and, uh, and it's imperative that this relationship, this reconciliation uh, is able to happen, then go and find somebody and have them come and, uh, and sit down with you. Now, so then who do you go and get? Uh, you go and get, um, you know, two or three of your big friends that are going to come and, uh, and blast away on this other person. How dare you hurt my friend in that way? No, no. You go and find someone who is objective, who's distant, who cares about both of you, and who's patient and has some skills in listening so that they can be an objective person in the room there with you and listen to what it is that has happened there for you so that then you can explain the case and the other person can too. And this other person may well uh, be able to offer some wisdom or some direction in how it is that you can that you can continue to to uh, to reconcile together and if that works sometimes having another person in the room if that works um, then thanks be to God and there's learning that has happened and and uh, they provided a gift of being able to to support and encourage you working towards reconciliation building the relationship um, but that doesn't always suffice right uh, 
And so then Jesus says, if that doesn't work, if even that doesn't work, then there is an issue here. And so then he says, um, he says, if they still refuse to listen to you, tell it to the church. Now, now what does that mean? Um, tell it to the church. So you get the news and events. And so then we'll put a, an ad in here and say, Sally Black is a real jerk because she treated me so badly, right? No, that is not, uh, that is not I think, what Jesus means. And that's not how it's been interpreted. Um, the, the, the encouragement is when he says to tell it to the church, to tell it to leaders within the church, the pastors, the leaders, the shepherds within the church, the people who then have, have been trained and have some skills in terms of being able to, to work with people through conflict and to be able to understand perspectives on how it is that things can happen in relationships so that, so that people can work their way through this. And so to be able to tell it to the church, to bring people who have who professional skills in order to be able to help you to resolve this issue. I tell you, I was, um, I was a young priest. I was working under, I was an assistant working under a rector, and, uh, and I'd been an assistant there for a couple of years, and I was ready to go and, uh, and kind of take on my next position. And, uh, and so I had, um, I had several churches that I was talking to. There was, there was one church in particular I was interested in. I'd met with their search committee. They were very, they were excited about me as a candidate. I was excited about going, them in to, to going with them, and they would have taken us closer to where our family was. And, uh, and so we'd been in conversation together, and then one day, um, they, the, the chairman of the search committee called, and, uh, and it, was, it was before voicemail, which really kind of dates me, right? <laughs> Um, but um, so in our church, you would call the church office and the receptionist would take down your message or just kind of, and it would say, you know, call back, you know, while you were out, so-and-so called and call them back. And so she, she filled out that little slip and she stuck it, but by mistake, not in my box, but in my boss's box. And so then when my boss came in, um, he just grabbed his, uh, his telephone slips, not noticing that my name was on the top. And uh, so he, uh, he ended up calling the director of the search committee. Now he'd been, he knew I was in, he would knew that I was, uh, that I was uh, in talking with other church, in fact, churches. In fact, he was a reference of mine. Um, but, uh, but this call was not, a, was not a requested call. They were expecting me to call them back. And now all of a sudden my boss was calling them back and, uh, and with, without really a point to their conversation. And so it was the next day that the, the, uh, that the search committee chair called me back and he said, you know, I, I had a very strange phone call from your boss. And, uh, and so we talked a little bit about it and then, uh, and then he says, oh, and by the way, um, we can't offer you the position, we've offered it to somebody else. Well, I was livid absolutely livid. I was sure that he had sabotaged my call um, to this, uh, to this um, new church. And so I, I got in my car and I made a beeline to his house and he opened the door and, uh, and I just let him have it. <laughs> I, I just, I, I really gave it to him. And, um, and, uh, and as we then talked, um, uh, he said, you know, Todd, he said, I think I think we need somebody else to help us. And, uh, and so it, fortunately we had a, a really wonderful bishop um, who was in town. And he said, uh, can we arrange to meet with the bishop? And so we, uh, we went down uh, to meet with the bishop and I just kind of laid out all of the, all of the, the situation as I, as I saw it and all of the pain and hurt that was there, lots of tears. And, uh, and then my boss, um, who had been really kind of surprised by the whole thing, um, then was able to explain how the message was in the wrong box and that uh, he hadn't intended to, uh, to do, any, do me any harm at all. In fact, was, was trying to be helpful um, for me. Um, and the bishop who sat there um, was just was patient. He was affirming. 
He was accepting. He didn't take sides. He was interested in, in supporting both of us in order to be able to get us to a place where our relationship could be healed. We could understand the truth of what happened and, and to, to be able to, uh, to continue to, to work and serve uh, together. And, um, and we did because we loved each other and, um, and we were able to do that. But I have forever been grateful for people like the bishop who was available to us, who we could call and say, you know, we're just, I, I, I'm in pain and we're stuck. And so we need somebody to just sit down and help us to talk our way through this. Um, it takes a, a lot to be able to trust that kind of a person to come. And so the gift of a peacemaker, a peacemaker, someone who's willing to be there in the relationship with you and not take sides, but to listen and encourage and, uh, and to lift up one another is such a gift to the church. And it is such, such a need in our culture and in our time for us to have peacemakers, that is people who give their time and energy to listen to the pains of others and to work towards reconciliation, to building the relationships of others. Because once you see that that can happen, then your confidence increases that you can, the next time there's a hurt or even other old hurts, that you can build, you can see yourself successfully work through those old wounds and come to a place of deeper wisdom and mutual appreciation appreciation, a deeper sense of community together, not just with people who always agree, but with people who can have varied opinions, but, but now all of a sudden can live in community and know that they still love each other. Boy, I'll tell you, in our world, in our world, in our current climate, we need, we crave the, the, the ability to be able to disagree, to be able to do it in healthy and, and, uh, and life-giving ways, to be able to share deeply from who we are. And if there's pain or, or shame involved in it, to be able to know that we're not going to be rejected, but that we can offer ourselves and that the community's response is not going to be to kind of sequester us, but to rally around us and to support us and to build up the integrity and dignity of each person. Um, but that doesn't even always work either, right? So Jesus says, um, and if they, if they tell it to the church and if they still refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector, <laughs> Well, ouch, what does that mean? So, and Jesus knew what uh, they would have been thinking. So if you were a good Jew, you knew exactly what that meant. So you had somebody who was not keeping the law, was not doing what it was that they were supposed to be doing on, as part of the community. What did you do? You, 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 uh, you, you forced them out of the community. You iced them out. You, you, uh, you shunned them. So they were not part of the community until finally they'd been humiliated enough that if they if they were ready then they could come back with their tail between their legs and we could tell them you know what what fools they'd been so is that what Jesus meant well um, we have to look at what it is that Jesus did with uh, with pagans and tax collectors right um, he went after them he didn't shun them he didn't, he didn't kick them out. He went after them in order to be able to win them. And so he, when it comes to tax collectors, the most, one of the most hated professions among the Jews, and yet he chooses one to be one of his disciples. The pagans were the ones that the church was able to bring the message to, and the church just exploded because of the conversion of, of Gentiles who came into the faith, but with a very different understanding of what the faith was all about. Jesus saw the importance of being able to, to go after with grace and mercy and persistence and fortitude to go after the wounded soul who was broken and to be able to, to do what we can to be able to bring them back in 
and to be able to see them restored. Immediately before this passage is the, is the, is the story of the shepherd who has a hundred sheep and one of the sheep gets lost. And so what does the shepherd do? The shepherd says, dumb sheep, stupid sheep, go, go. You get whatever you deserve. You, 99, you're great. I love you and I'm gonna stay with you and we're just gonna hug each other forever, right? No, no, he says, you, 99, you're doing fine. That one needs me. And so where am I going? I'm going after him. I'm going to go see what it takes to bring him or her back into the flock. That takes a lot of work. I mean, it takes tremendous investment of energy and resources. But, but that's the kind of kingdom that that Jesus was establishing and working with for his, with his disciples to go after the one who was lost. And it creates then a culture of people who continually are attuned to the needs of those who are the outsiders so that we can create an environment that's, that's safe and that, and that allows people to be accepted when they would expect to be rejected and iced out. Jesus is trying to build his community, his church. He's laying those foundation pieces to allow the church to be the church where people can come and flourish and to discover in conflict, and conflict is inevitable. Conflict is part of the way that we grow. And so this opportunity through conflict to be able to see one another's perspective in a new light and to be able to come alongside one another. And I have to say, so in a culture and in a time when, when to be divergent um, is perilous, when because you belong to one political party, you're all of a sudden the enemy of another political party. And you can't wait to somehow backbite the people who, who have different political views than you do. It's not the way of the followers of Jesus. As we come to him, as we look to him, as we are touched by him, as we're forgiven by him, as we're formed by him, our life takes on a life of its own, filled with his own grace and mercy. At the very end of this passage, he says, for where two or three gather in my name, there am I with them. Where two or three gather in my name but always think the same way always vote the same way always do the same thing and never conflict no where two or three gather in my name and in spite of the conflict in spite of the divergence in spite of the culture in spite of all of the stuff going on in the world around us in spite of it all as we seek him and follow him, his presence is among us, and it creates a richness that, frankly, you can't find any place else. What is the hope of the world? What is out there that allows us to be believers that, that, that the future is going to be a good place? I don't know. I don't know what that is. Um, if it is not Jesus and not his community and not his calling to be his people and to shine his light in the world. And so, and so we gather, <laughs> some here, some out there, to shine his light in the world, to give his good news, and to work as a community of his love. Amen. So let's stand together and affirm the faith of our hearts and of our lives by using the form of the Nicene.